I am Elizabeth Lindsay, and I am an explorer for National Geographic. Hello, and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi A14, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now, let's get started with this episode. Uh, I was born in a very small town in Hawaii, surrounded by sugarcane fields and, you know, really quite poor in terms of our community was rural. Um, but I had a beautiful childhood because I was raised by Hawaiian elders who were very um, wise in the way that they loved the world and loved nature. And so I grew up with a strong foundation for caring for humanity in that way. Uh, would you want to tell me a little bit more about the background where you grew up? Tell me more about that place because I think it really was very interesting to hear. So uh, in your time as a young adolescent, what do you see around you? Help me understand that. Beautiful, beautiful question, Amehi. Um, my childhood was mostly at the ocean, you know, because this is Hawaii and we're an island. Um, and our, my life growing up was, was very simple. I mean, the things that brought me joy as a child still bring me so much joy as an adult because I care less about the success of the world as I care about um, people and what causes their hearts to rejoice and to break. I care about the way that we treat one another and that we the ways we treat the environment. Um, I would be so curious to know about your life and to know about the things that bring you joy and the things that cause your heart to hurt. And these, these have always been things I care most about. Mm -hmm. All right, that, that's, that's really interesting. Now, would you like to share with me, I'm curious, uh, what influenced your choice of career uh, when you, before you become what you are today? I want to understand what influenced you to take that trajectory. Yes, it's a very, very good question. Um, my elders that I was mentioning to you about, uh, when I was seven years old, they brought me into their circle and they said, someday the world will be in trouble and it will take the wisdom from the far edges of the earth to return the world to balance. And if you choose to, you will go far away to keep their voices alive. And so I was only seven at the time, but the words stayed with me that even though I came from a small town surrounded by sugarcane field and the idea of traveling the world seemed so almost impossible to me because it was so big a dream. I just felt like someday, maybe if this is my destiny, then I will do everything I can to fulfill it. And, and then many years later, I grew up to become an anthropologist. And anthropology for me simply means bearing witness to the world, loving the world so much that you suspend your own prejudices to be able to listen to the languages and the songs and the prayers of other people. We believe that everyone has a story to share. We believe in the power of storytelling in today's digital economy. Yes, we believe that our audience need to be touched at the level of emotion so we can better engage. What about you? Do you believe in storytelling as much as we do? Do you want to reach the hearts and minds of your audience? Then join us with our online training class, Storytelling for Content Creators and Digital Entrepreneurs. Come. Come to obehiawonfood.com slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skills so you can earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. Storytelling is a powerful instrument at our disposal. Let's explore it together. See you in the class. And bear witness to them. And so I became an anthropologist, and then some years later, I became an explorer for National Geographic. All right. Now, you are an anthropologist. Uh, of course, I'm going to ask you a few things about that as we progress. 
you are also uh, an explorer for National Geographic. Do you also do other things or these are the big things that occupy your time today? No, actually, I'm, I'm currently working on a very large project that I, I can't talk about just yet, but it has been a 12-year dream of mine um, to make sure that we protect the world's wisdom and knowledge. So, for example, in your beautiful part of the world, there is this deep ancestral knowledge and wisdom that holds many answers to some of the problems that our world is currently facing. And I find that to be true of, you know, most cultures, whether, you know, we are in Africa or India or South America or parts of Asia or Hawaii in the Pacific, there is wisdom that is held within these cultures that the world desperately needs right now. Okay, I'm taking some time to, to reflect on that. <laughs> it's a lot. Mm, anyway, I'll come to that uh, later. Uh, now, you, you are working as a, Ge a National Geographic Explorer. Yes. What does that mean? That's a very good question. Everybody asks that. Um, it simply means that, that each of us has an area of expertise or a passion that we are pursuing, for me, it's about making sure that the world's wisdom is not lost, that our ancestors and our elders um, do not pass away without our recording their knowledge and their wisdom. All right. Now, now how do you do that? Do you want to explain to me a bit more? How do you tell me about your day work? How does it, how does it go? Well, you know, it goes differently in different ways. So if I travel by myself, which I sometimes do, I'm not a great photographer or a great filmmaker, but um, I do my best. And luckily, you know, all of us have mobile devices now. So we are able to record things that even a decade or two ago, we didn't have the kinds of technology that is so affordable. So I, I use that when I'm out in the field or I'll use some, some cameras that I'm more familiar with. Other times I go out with a crew and um, they are able to document and record the things, the interviews that we have. More importantly than my own documentation, I encourage and really um, try to nurture people within their own cultures to record the voices and the wisdom of their parents and grandparents and great grandparents if they're still alive and um, find ways that, that these voices and this legacy is not forgotten. That is very interesting for me now. So you, you go around the world, try to, you are actually exploring or you are exploring for the National Geographic. Um, what exactly are you looking for? I mean, uh, what, do you, what do you intend to find when you enter into um, a connection with people, with a new culture, I want to presume, because of course the world is big, no? So as you uh, get immersed in this culture, what are you looking for? What is your very direction? Good. Very good. I am, I am really seeking out wisdom. We call it um, cultural intelligence or systems of knowledge that are often forgotten or marginalized. And these bits of, of wisdom and knowledge are then recorded and you start to see similar patterns around the world. For example, in Hawaii, um, my elders would plant and fish according to the moon cycles. You know, on a full moon, they planted certain plants and fished for certain fish. And we never ever took more fish than what we needed. We had ways of harvesting water and saving water and um, using it judiciously. So these are the kinds of things that I record. And as I go around the world, I'm looking for cultures that can teach me the kinds of principles and skills 
that they have used for, for planting and gathering food and saving water in very similar ways because I, 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 when you start to, when you start to travel and look at all of these different cultures and how they're addressing these certain aspects, you see that there are similar patterns in all of them. Now, when you move around the world in different culture, um, what do you see? I want you to lend me your eyes to see what you see. Tell me what you see. Oh, what a beautiful question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Um, when I look, when I travel and I am invited into another culture, the first thing that I do always is when I touch down on a new land, I always say a quiet prayer and ask permission to be there. Um, to me, it's the same as going to someone's home. You wouldn't just walk into the door without permission. That I always take my shoes off at the door as a show of honor and respect for the home that I'm entering. When I come to a new land, I always walk very humbly as a show of respect and honor to the culture. Um, do you tend to see a kind of, um, um, I don't want to say uniformity, but a kind of uh, correlation uh, among different cultures as you move now, you maybe you leave the United States. Uh, of course, even within the United States, you can already see a lot of uh, dimension to uh, the different components that make us our life, our uh, culture, our heredity, where we are coming from and all that. But now, assuming you move out of there now, you get to, I don't know, Canada, then you come to Europe, then, or you come to more uh, ancestral homes, uh, places like Africa, and then you go to India. Do you see some similarity in the way that people behave and how people define their rules of life and engagement? or what we want to call culture. Tell me more about that. Yes, and you're asking such fantastic questions of me. Um, what I find is that the more I am visiting cultures that are removed from the big cities, the more I find uh, a deeper similarity with um, the wisdom around the world, people who look into the eyes of one another and are much more respectful and honoring where they don't measure success by the amount of money that they have or by the clothes that they wear or the homes that they live in. You know, the, the truer definition of wealth for them is their nobility, their wisdom, their kindness, their compassion. That to me is much more important. Uh -huh. Now, this information that you gather, uh, okay, I understand you are doing this for the National Geographic. No, I, I, no so, I'm, I'm actually doing this for my own project that oh. I share with National Geographic. Okay, that's cool. That's interesting. That's even more interesting now. So what do you do when you gather this information? What happens to them? Yeah, well, that's what we are working on right now. What we're doing is we're building a living library of the world's knowledge to make it available. As people choose to make it available, they always, they can decide whether or not they want their, their um, wisdom and knowledge to be shared or they can keep it for their families, but at least they know that it is saved and protected so that when they pass away, their families and their descendants will have this knowledge. That's what we're working on right now. All right. Now, I think you use the term word knowledge uh, up to three or four times here. So I want you to take some time to explain it. Uh, by word knowledge, what are you talking about? Help us understand that. I just love your questions. You're so good. So knowledge for me is knowledge that has been passed on for many generations. It's not something you learn in a book at school because most of the books or many of the books that we study from don't have this vast ancestral knowledge that says that this is how, this is the moon under which you plant these plants, that you face their leaves to the east where the sun is rising and gentle to these leaves. And I've watched how elders, when they, when they bless their tools and they bless the land and they bless their plants, their crops are so much more abundant 
And this is the kind of knowledge that I'm gathering. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we are living in the age that is dominated by a computer with AI, artificial intelligence, and all sort of um, technology. Of course, technology is not new to us. We will be using technology for since the ancient time, but this is a different kind of technology, you know? So with all this technology in front of us today, and someone might ask, do we still need to understand the knowledge of the ancient time going to uh, some remote culture and document them? If someone were to ask you that question, what would you say? It's, it's a, another very good question, and the answer is yes. I value the our native cultural intelligence as much as I value any of our current technology because both are necessary. Let me give you an example of why this ancient technology matters. And this is just one of many, many examples around the world. So in India, they built these beautiful, what look like temples, they're called step wells. And during the monsoon season, these step wells would, would serve as reservoirs to collect and harvest water so that during the dry season, the communities would have water for their people. And that is an ancient technology that these temples were built specifically. I mean, they, they were also conducted, you know, sacred ceremonies and practices there, but it was also used to gather water and harvest water. And so it's important that we, excuse me, it's important that we also look at, it's, it's called ethnomimicry, how you can use, what lessons can we learn from this ancient knowledge and cultural intelligence and cultural technology that we can apply to the modern world to help us through some of our most urgent problems. So now there's an architectural firm in Europe that is studying these step wells in India to learn how they can help water harvest to address the issues of water scarcity in the world. So that's, that's one demonstration of how ancient technology and knowledge can serve you know, today's world. Hmm. That, that is really very interesting. Uh, you see, uh, anyway, I think in your explanation before, you said that there are some similarities. Actually, I specifically ask you the question as if you see some similarity among different cultures because we are too uh, removed, you know, we are separated by a very huge amount of water that limit our ability to communicate all the time. Uh, but of course, we still communicate at least times to modern technology. We are now uh, in connection. You are there in Hawaii. I'm here in Italy. We are talking in a fraction of a second. We are here in You're Italy. You're in Italy? Yeah, yeah. I'm in Italy, yeah. Ah, and I'm in Washington, D.C. Ah, okay. You are in Washington, D.C. You see, that that's great. So uh, it appears as maybe we are just uh, next neighbor. This is thanks to the technology that we have today. Uh, but uh, apart from that, uh, there is, uh, we are really very far from each other. Our evolution has been um, separated by several years and, and distances. So why is it that despite that, we still have a lot of similarity in our culture? I mean, our root culture, our deep culture, because if you go to interact with, uh, with Native Americans now, if you go to um, some deep parts in Africa, mm -hmm. or maybe in India, you see that the way that people behave is very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only maybe when we talk about city now, we might have some uh, differences. But if we, these differences, if it depends on, on our ability to interpret them, we can see that they are even very close, the way that we behave, what we do, our mm, uh, things like that. So I want you to spend some time there explaining that. So the question is, why do we see, why do we have a lot of similarity among God, despite the fact that we might be living uh, several hundreds of kilometers apart from each other? Yes, because, you know, when we, my father was a very famous genealogist who, in genealogy is studying our ancestry and our lineage. And so when we, when we go back far enough in studying our ancestors, we realize that we're all connected, that we all came from the same region of the world 
that even though we now speak different languages, the color of our skin is different, our traditions and our practices are different, our root system is the same. It's almost like a, we're leaves of a tree that are uniquely our own. And yet when we go deep enough, we find that we are all part of the same roots. And um, that answers your question quite nicely because it just takes us back far enough to know that we're all part of the same family. And my father would often say, if people knew, if they really understood that a man is our brother and every woman is our sister, that this knowledge would make war look insane, you know, because we would understand that we are fighting brother and brother are fighting against one another and it would make no sense. All right. Now, this uh, uh, documentation, which I find to be uh, very important today, because um, I think sometimes a lot of things are happening, you know, in that our ability to keep record of what is happening could have been very important if we were doing it all the time, because then we are talking of history. Yeah. The reason we understand or we should study history is so that we don't repeat the error of the past. Does it necessarily mean we are going to the past? We cannot, we don't have the possibility to do that. The past is past. What we only have is now and the future. But for us to even understand where we are now and possibly imagine what it can be in the future, we need to know what is before us. That's right. I mean, that's yeah. very, it, it, it's very short sighted for people. Well, the past is the past. This is now. And we're focused on the future because the way that we navigate and even, you know, when, when we can only, we can only know where we're going when we know where we've come from. Otherwise, we, we have no basis from which to navigate our lives or into the future. We become much more masterful when we have learned lessons from the past so that we become much more um, precise and brilliant in the decisions that we make navigating forward. All right. Th thank you for that. that that's really important. It's, it's vital. It's yeah, vital. It is. <laughs> it's vital because the world is changing so fast. It's only the person that is blind that doesn't see it. It changes so fast, faster than anything that has ever happened in our history before. And as it changes so fast, if we are not careful, it doesn't mean that we're actually going to commit suicide as, a, as humanity, but we are going to, re if we don't keep record of the past, we are going to rewrite something completely different uh, so that the world is going to be completely, completely different. Uh, but... I don't know whether it is good or bad, but at least as a human being, I think it is important that we keep record of our past so that whatever we do is going to reflect it somehow. Because the past now, those that are believing there are our ancestors. They have been there. That is why we are here. We cannot be here without them. So it is important that we have that record so that whatever it is that we are doing today, uh, by extension, what we are preparing also for our for our children and the future generation should have a, a correlation, should have a connection, should have, the line should never break. So in that sense, when you go out, what do you see in terms of documentation? Because now you need to interact with people. Uh, when these people are talking to you, they also make reference to their past. <laughs> I think this is what is very beautiful about us as human beings. So help me understand what you see in terms of the recollection, yeah. Yes, people, when the people that I interview, some of the elders are very older, I mean, much older. Um, you know, I in Italy, actually, in Sardinia, I was with elders who, I was with one woman who was 114 years old. And, you know, the beauty of being surrounded by elders who have lived such a long life is they have all of this experience. And... It's important that we not lose ourselves or be blinded by, you know, a world that is driven, um, that is youth oriented, because there's so much that we have to learn from our elders. And sometimes it's our own prejudice against ageism that keeps us from seeing value in what they share. But what I have learned a lot from being with these elders is that they see a continuum of you know where they have come from and those that preceded them it's like 
I love this, this quote by Sir Isaac Newton, where he said, To be a great content creator in today's fast-changing economy, you need one thing, storytelling. Storytelling is a powerful instrument to leverage, either for personal use or for your business success. This is why this training class, Storytelling for Content Creator and Digital Entrepreneurs, was created. It is designed to help you leverage the power of storytelling so you can stand out from the crowd and earn more in your business. Come to obehayairwanfo.com slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skill to earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. You need the power of storytelling to stand out in the competition. So let's explore it together. See you in the class. If I can see further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I believe that this work is just like that. In order for us to see further, and as you so rightly said, you know, we would make the mistake of writing the future with no basis um, and, and maybe writing it incorrectly if we don't have a foundation of the past to reflect upon, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and for that, of course, we're going to thank a company like Google for what they have done in the documentation, in the making of, because I think they have had a very clear objective from the beginning, yes. which is the documentation of world yes. knowledge yes. Uh, in one place. This is something very important, because today we can document something, any part of the world, and in a fraction of a second, we can have access to that. That is really very fascinating. And, and I think we need to do more of that. Um, yeah, there are limits to everything, though. But anyway, now... Um, on the basis of what do you choose who to interview? Uh, what, what, on the basis of what do you choose, what is relevant to you? Well, for me, um, I'm very close actually to, to some elders in, in South Africa um, who were very close to Credo Mutua. And for me, what's important, you know, 96% of the world's languages are spoken by just 3% of the world's population. And what that means is that, you know, many of these cultures that are speaking, the majority of the languages in the world are very vulnerable. So my goal and mission is to protect those voices immediately so that we don't lose the languages which are encoded with all of this information. That's my first priority. And that is a great priority. It is. <laughs> yes. and, and talking of, um, our fear not to lose the past. Um, I would imagine that, uh, okay, of course, this doesn't fall on your table uh, uh, always because we need bigger power and bigger money to be able to uh, finance some of this project. Uh, how would it be that all the languages in the world could have a record, a digital record, so that it can be accessible for people that are going to be here many years from now? How, 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 how would it be for our civilization as a people? Of course, I don't know. Maybe this could be the work that will be done by, uh, by UNESCO. But in any case, instead of uh, uh, studying it, uh, thinking that maybe this language like, like this will be there, we could keep a record of it, a video record, uh, an audio record, a written record of all the languages that are living in the world today, 2022. What do you think about that? You know, there have been really wonderful organizations, including UNESCO and National Geographic with the Endangered Languages um, that, that are doing fantastic work. And we are joining them in our effort in this project that we're working on to help facilitate and help them protect and perpetuate the work that they've done. I mean, this is part of the project. So you're you know, interestingly, you're just spot on with your question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I was talking before about um, the thing that, that people recollect, no? You see, if you go to, you know, uh, one mistake was made in Egypt. Whether it was deliberate or not, nobody can actually tell, you know? I'm talking of the burning down or the burning of uh, uh, um, the Library of Alessandra, no? Yes. <laughs> 
uh, you can't calculate that loss. That is a huge loss to human history. Uh, today, we have record, we have the possibility of able to document anything we want to document. Of course, not only for ourselves, because of course we are still here, but let's see 1,000 years from now, let's see 2,000 years from now, how are people going to assess this information? If we burn it down, they cannot see everything. They cannot see anything at all. Like for example, the library of uh, Tibutu, uh, those are the, all the manuscripts that are there, for example. And if someone could document those things, how would it be? I'm just, I'm just thinking aloud. I'm very excited that you're asking me these questions and I only wish that I could talk about it um, further with you because it's exactly what we're working on with some of the most state-of-the-art technologies available right now. And, um, you know, in about a year's time, I'll be able to talk with you more openly about this. But it's so interesting that you bring up the Library of Alexandria because, you um, you know, I see that many of these elders are like our living libraries of Alexandria. And as an elder passes away, a library is burned. So we want to make sure to the best of our ability that we don't lose many more of these, li these living libraries and our elders before they pass away. Thank you for that. Uh, well, because of time constraint, what would be your last statement here to conclude the conversation? Well, my, my last statement would be this. I appreciate the thoughtfulness and the insight of your questions. You have asked me things that I've never been asked before. And, you know, our, our project is, you know, is, is in development. So we haven't even written about it. And yet you were able to just in the course of interviewing me, started to, to build upon and, and bring out what we're doing, which is incredible incredibly perceptive of you. And so I just want to, in my closing statement, thank you, one, for this interview, and two, for being, you know, so brilliant in, and keen in your thinking. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ben. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Overhead Podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain over here at one Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.